Welcome back, troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Bidding got fierce on this guitar on eBay, but I won it because I've been wanting to document one of these things for a long time on the show. This is one of Gibson's fancy takes on the Explorer from the 80s. So while we're unboxing it here, let's do a little bit of a quick recap of Gibson Explorers. So the Explorer was first introduced in the late 50s with a nice Carina body. They were a little bit too futuristic for that point in time, so they didn't make too many of them. If you want to learn more about the nitty gritty details, check out this review and demo of a collector's edition. So then, Explorers weren't really made too often in the 60s. I gotta say too often, because sometimes there's like leftover parts ones that occasionally exist that may be a custom order or something crazy. But as far as a production run, no, they did not exist until they brought them back officially in 1976. Now, will you find a handful of 75s? Yes, but the first full official year is 76 when they brought them back in a limited edition. And they actually said limited edition on the back, but this time they were made out of mahogany and they changed a few other things about them. But the 70s was apparently the correct time for these because they sold so well, Gibson decided to leave them in production. So in the late 70s, around 1979, Gibson decided to revamp not only the Explorer, but also the Flying V at the same time, introducing the E2 and the V2. Now, if you want to learn about the V2, I've done an old video on one that you can check out here. It's in Candy Apple Red. And I also have a really old one of a, somebody who scalloped one with a really rare finish. But the E2s were interesting because they used multi-laminate wood construction. So you either had maple walnut maple sandwiches or walnut maple walnut sandwiches. So you can find lighter colored ones and darker colored ones. But take a look at the contours of the body of those. They kind of sculpt them away so they'd be a little bit more comfortable for some players to play. And they also gave them the multi-pieced necks. Those things are kind of cool and quirky in their own way, but they're not the most popular. So finally, the model I have to share with you guys today is part of the E2 series, but at the same time, I've been seeing some new terminology being toted by Reverb, calling these the Explorer. We'll dive a little bit more into that here in a second, but let's go ahead and get this beauty out and hope it arrived okay and it was advertised correctly because I always have bad luck on eBay, but that doesn't mean I'm never going to not try when something nice shows up. So this, my friends, is what is known as the Gibson E2 Explorer CMT. CMT stands for Curly Maple Top. Now, why does it have that? Well, it's because it has a curly maple top. Now, some of these that you see will be branded E2, so that's why I say they are part of the E2 lineup, despite not having anything else that makes the E2 series interesting. You no longer have any contour cars right here. You don't have the essentially pancake construction that those ones did. You don't have the multi-piece neck made of different woods anyways. I mean, this is still a multi-piece maple neck, and this one still has a maple body that makes it kind of interesting. But as far as the electronics, yeah, they're the same. They've got the Dirty Fingers pickups. But then again, some of these don't don't have the E2 branding on the truss rod cover. They're just plain. I think it really just depends on when they were made. Gibson was probably just trying to use up parts to be my guess. But I've been seeing Reverb call these the Explorers, and I've never heard that terminology before. That doesn't mean that it didn't exist at one point in time, because there is something called a uh, the V, and it had very similar specs to this. It was just a regular flying V, except for it had a flame maple top to it with the binding, and you know, it was a little bit more fancy. We'll document one of those one day as well. But here we go. Isn't this just a beautiful guitar? It kind of gives you faux Carina like vibes because once again, it's the maple body, the multi-piece maple neck. The flame figuring is a nice bonus on these things, but you can hardly even tell it's bound because all the colors just look, you know, very light and maple-y. So whether it's part of the E2 series or if it was called something else, the CMT series was something that Gibson did a lot in the 80s. You can find a few different models that get the curly maple top outside of even the V, because sometimes those are called the V CMT. But besides the specs we were talking about, what makes this different from a regular Explorer, I believe will be our heel join right here. This kind of has what some flying Vs have in that era, where the neck actually sticks up a little bit more on the body, so it's a little bit more proud, instead of just being flush with the body like many of modern day Explorers are. One last quick fact, the CMT Explorer and V were probably created as a follow-up to the Dean V and Z guitars that had flame tops that look suspiciously similar to these things. So these fancy guitars were likely birthed as a response to the newfound love of those. So to learn more about the CMT Explorer, let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench to take a look at its parts and specs. Yeah. 
inside the E2. Let's learn about all of its secrets. So first off, starting with our pickups. I don't even have to show you the backside, and you should know that these are dirty fingers due to the double row of adjustable pull pieces. That is the calling card of the dirty fingers. These are hot ceramic pickups that were just introduced in the late 70s, so they were pretty new at the time of this. I mean, this particular guitar, they're about four years old at that point. But the backside of them looks like this. It'd be pretty easy to confuse this for a Tim Shaw PAF because they had the same date stamps on them, except for your model number up here is a little bit different, but you read the last three the same. So the first one is what month it was produced. So we've got August of 1982 on this one. And now our bridge pickup is a little bit different. The earliest Dirty Fingers actually have the T-top bobbins on them. So I guess you could call it a T-top Dirty Finger, but just call it a Dirty Fingers pickup because that's what it is. But looking at the back side of this one, it actually reads August of 1979. So there's a few different possibilities here. Somebody has replaced this pickup with an error correct one. We'll have to look at our solder joints in here to see if that's the case. Or they were just using up old stuff, entirely possible. But both are Dirty Fingers, just the neck did not have the T-bobbins because they stopped using those in 1980. All right, pickup cavity time. So you can actually see the maple body right here. And you've got your maple neck tenon going into your cavity right here. This appears to be like some CNC router bit would be my guess. Kind of similar to what you find in some of the Mexican made fender products, how they have holes. Then I really like the bridge pickup cavity because it's got a lot of ringage. But here's the thing about CMTs. I always call them veneer tops. And a lot of people think that they're top tops. But this, yeah, like some of these models, they're a little bit thicker than this. But this appears to just be a complete veneer top. So that's probably pretty paper thin, kind of like one of those photo flames. Except for, obviously, this is a real maple veneer but they can get away with doing that on this particular one because they put the binding on it. So a lot of people think, you know, it's just as thick as the binding. Not on the E2. That's what I'm seeing on this one anyways. But you're also going to notice that the pickup rings are giant. I mean, they're extra thick. That's because your neck has been joisted up here. They have to have the extra thickness. So this is like a normal bridge pickup ring, and this is like an ultra bridge pickup ring. It definitely feels weird holding this guitar because of that phenomenon. Now we'll take a quick look at our pick guard here. Nothing too much to really note. I sprayed it down with some deoxid on the backside here to clean up some of the oxidization. And now that's looking pretty good and probably won't be as scratchy anymore. But no real identifying marks there. But again, you can see inside of your maple body here, all routed out in the usual explorer fashion. We do have some numbers in there. Not sure what they mean. Well, that's another area where you can see it's just a paper thin top. Now, strangely enough, it looks like somebody maybe on purpose bent the jack plate. It's either that or they had something sticking out. It dinged against something and it bent it. But it kind of helps it stick out at a more straight angle right there. So that's what makes me think that maybe, just maybe, that was done on purpose. So our bridge pickup, 15.16 and our neck, 15.09. Middle position for fun, 7.56. That's like a normal humbucker reading. Dirty fingers pickups. Generally, the vintage sets are around 15 and the newer ones are around 16. Now let's take a look at these. In case you didn't notice in the unboxing, the bridge and tailpiece are a little bit special. So what on earth is this bridge? Check out this video if you need to learn more. This is the three point top adjust tunematic bridge. So you can actually find a few different varieties of these, a brass saddle and a nylon saddle version. This is the brass saddle one, and this is in remarkably clean shape. Usually the gold's all worn off of these, so that is very nice. But they call it the top adjust because the way you adjust your intonation is you loosen that screw and then you move this along there in a sliding fashion instead of adjusting down here or over there. And it's called three point top adjust because it actually has three selections on each side. So you could set your bridge up like that or like this or most people just go straight on, or there's the less extreme versions of it. So there's quite a few different ways you can set this up. And that's great if like your neck wasn't set right and you need a little bit more intonation room. But one of the leading reasons why Gibson started to use this in the mid eighties is because they could use it for both left-handed and right-handed guitars. They wouldn't have to put the studs in the body any particular way. But this was very, very, very shortly lived. We're talking like a year and a half, two years. It's kind of like these bad boys we have over here too, the Posi Lock Strap Locks. You only saw those for maybe four or five years. 
but thankfully this still has them in both locations. Now we're not lucky enough to have the flip out winding tuners on this example, but it's just an example of something cool that happened in the early 80s. And then this bad boy was birthed in the late 70s. It's a Rendell Wall creation called the TP6 tailpiece. It's a fine tuning tailpiece that looks fancy. I honestly don't really like the way these things make your guitar feel when you play it. The tension just feels a little bit different the way this one works. But Gibson only used these on like limited editions and ultra high end guitars. So they definitely have a very cool aesthetic to them. And a lot of people go, why do you need that if you don't have a locking nut? I mean, it's just like a violin. You can just do a quick fine tuning if you don't want to mess with your pegs. For me, these are all about cosmetics. But they work by putting the ball end of the string in there. And then as you tighten that screw down, it starts to protrude. And then that moves this ever so slightly to do the adjustments. Now we've got our knobs that are beautifully aged, two volumes and a tone. And let's just take a second to appreciate this beautiful example. I've always really liked these natural E2 CMTs because Again, it just kind of looks like a Carina Explorer, but on steroids, but they're really constructed vastly different. So you can't really get the same feel out of them, but it's definitely a unique piece. I would say collector's condition with a big asterisk. If you're looking for mint new old stock, no. But if you're looking for a clean example that's been taken care of that, yeah, it's got some nicks and dings and gouges here and there, but overall it presents greatly, this is what you want. Like for example, if you get it in the light, you can see some impressions there. It looks like maybe our TP6 tailpiece came off at one point in time, kind of like dinged it up a bit right there. But the flame veneer does a pretty good job of hiding most of it, but definitely not perfect. And you got scratches here, but maybe you could buff those out. But I did one of my deep clean polishing jobs on this because it was in good shape when I unboxed it, right? But it definitely had that I've been stored in a collection for 25 years feel to it. So now it's like brand new. So moving on from our three-piece maple body, we've got our three-piece maple neck and an ebony fretboard. We've got 22 frets on this bad boy. They're your typical low wide frets of the era. They might be too low for you if you're used to modern day guitars, so they can take some getting used to, but we have real mother of pearl dot inlays, so that's a nice little touch. And after a fret polish here, you can see maybe just a little bit of fret wear on like your second fret, but everything else is looking fairly good, especially for being 1982. It's possible it's been leveled and recrowned. But spec wise, it's your usual 24 and 3 quarter inch scale length with a nut measuring 1.69 inches. 12th fret measures 2.06. First fret neck depth 0.9 and really chunks up to 1.06 by the 12th. Here's the neck profile at the first fret and the 12th fret. Just a nice rounded C shape. So now we move on to the headstock. We do have a very small lacquer chip on the S right there. You can see it a little bit better at this angle. That's pretty common. But that's right, you have a Gibson Mother of Pearl logo on that one with gold Schaller tuners. Looks like our truss rod is in perfect shape. And this is one of those models that you can trump people on that say Gibson only has ever used two screw truss rod covers. Nope, the E2 is an exception to that rule. This one uses three. Now it's not your normal three shape one. Now the true reason why they made them you know, kind of wonky in shape, it's because explorers are weird in general. If you ever take one off, the screw holes never line up perfectly with this shape because of the whole headstock design. So a lot of times workers would mess up and line up the top screw here and there, and then you'd have a really wonky looking truss rod cover. So I'm betting that's why the E2, the second version of the Explorer, they did this. Now when they came out with the third version, the Alder body, kind of cheaper versions of the Explorer, they went back to the other way because apparently they decided it wasn't worth it. <laughs> but these covers are pretty cool. Cursive E slash two, and that is all deeply engraved into this three ply truss rod cover. Uh, just when I thought I finally had a successful eBay purchase, while cleaning the guitar, I found something that I didn't want to see. Ouch. It's about an inch and a half long crack that's about a quarter of an inch deep. You can see it runs all the way the length of the body until it gets to the neck. Does it go down further than that? I don't know. Now, granted, I cleaned it up, so maybe some of the dirt and gunk was hiding it. That's what I get for trying to call this thing collector's grade, because now, now there's a crack. <laughs> it's a great player's grade in great shape. So I don't know what the fate of this is going to be, if I need to return it for insurance money. I don't know at the time of recording. 
But you can see some buckle worming back here. Nothing too crazy, but I just love the figuring of the maple because you get the wood grain, but you also have like a little bit of flame figuring. So this thing will really come to life outside. Looking forward to those B-roll shots, but it's actually a three piece back. So you got one piece right there, another piece right there, and then another one right here. I guess it's more appropriate to call this the body rather than the back, because as we know, it's just a flame maple veneer to hide the three pieces of maple back here. But hey, for an explorer, the edges are not in too bad of shape. Since these things are kind of pokey, usually the edges get all beat up, which it is a little bit beat up on the lower fin. Maybe a small binding crack right there. Looks like a couple of scratches. I know there's a couple of finish checks. It's really hard to see, just, just like a small one here, a few of them around the binding I saw on the edges. That's kind of hard to show you though. But now, what's the verdict on the electronics? To me, this looks factory. Because the one that should look weird is this one, and it looks exactly the same as that. So unless they were both taken out at the exact same time, and then a different one swapped in, and then these put in, that is a possibility, but the work is so cleanly done. All the solder blobs are looking about right, so... In my opinion, it's factory stock original. But I'm curious, just how thick is this body? It's like 1.68 inches. But now let's go over here to our three-piece maple neck. Zach Wild would like this neck because his original bullseye custom was made around this era and that's what they were using at that time. So what is this? This is stand rash or something was in the case, but one of those cheap rubber stands that has that like U shape. Yeah, that's exactly what that's from. Now you could strip off the finish, refinish the neck to get rid of it, but I almost let that scare me away from bidding on this one. It definitely affected my max bid. But now that I've seen it in person, it's like a non-issue. Now I did notice there's like a small spot on the neck right here that's like slightly flattened, like maybe a capo was on it. I mean, you can't really see it. You don't really feel it unless you see it reflecting in the light and you're going for it. But worth mentioning anyways. And what's kind of interesting about a Maple Neck Explorer is the fact that you can really see the contour that they gave it right here. I don't think normal explorers are quite that rounded. Maybe they are and I just haven't seen it because I haven't had a bare maple neck on one of them. But there you can see the four pieces of wood that make up this. So one, two, three, and a fourth little nub. But the serial number of this one dates it to 1982, 264th day of the year. 007 so that means it's Kalamazoo made and the eighth one in production because there is a triple zero starting that and made in USA with our Gibson Schaller tuners six on a side it's a shame these couldn't have had the Cluson style ones I love explorers with Cluson tuners on them they just look so cool as far as the condition a couple of dings up here all said and done cleaned up Fresh strings, all that, probably for nothing, because of the crack on the back. <laughs> 9 pounds, 15.3 ounces. That's 10 pounds. That is a heavy explorer. But then again, you got to remember, Les Paul Customs were like 10, 11 pounds in this era, sometimes up to 13. So in the grand scheme of things for this giant maple body, is it really that bad for an 82? I'll leave that up to you. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and get a couple of tone samples. So as usual, dirty fingers pickups really drive your amp. So you're gonna wanna turn them down. That was about on like a seven or an eight. So we'll do a few more examples of just that. And they respond very well to touch. So I've been trying to be very soft with these.
depends what amp you're really using, but I really like these rolled down to about six and a half. That's when they start to sound normal to me. Let's try it yeah. with a little bit of dirt. <laughs> Now that we know all about the Explorer E2 CMT, what are my final thoughts on this thing? As far as Explorers go, I'm not gonna tell you it was my favorite. I mean, this is a very body heavy instrument. I know 10 pounds might not necessarily seem like a lot in this era, but having it all within the body, like I can feel the neck is actually pretty light in comparison to the hard rock maple that they were using on this. I mean, it's very similar to like the style of body that they used on the Victory series. I mean, it's, it's hurting my back just trying to play this thing. So if you're interested in one of these CMTs, definitely keep that in mind. Maybe ask the seller the weight. I'm sure there's probably a couple of light examples out there as well as heavy ones, but there's not too many of these really out there. Most collectors have already snapped these things up because of their particular beauty. At this point in time, I don't know the fate of this one. Hopefully maybe I can just get a partial refund because I mean, otherwise it's actually pretty good. These Dirty Fingers pickups really drive your amp. And at first I was a little bit lost to what to do with this, but then when I started to play like some error correct pieces, that's when this thing kind of started to come to life. So personally, I think I need to spend a little bit more time with this until I can really fully unlock its true potential. But man, what a beautiful explorer. Where else can you get a flame top explorer from the 80s? Not too many. Although this might've been more appropriately named the CMV, curly maple veneer. All right, troglodytes, thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.